And Moses, with the elders of Israel, commanded the people, saying, Keep all the commandments which I command you this day. And it shall be on the day when ye shall pass over Jordan unto the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, that thou shalt set thee up great stones, and plaster them with plaster. And thou shalt write upon them all the words of this law, when thou art passed over, that thou mayest go in unto the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, a land that floweth with milk and honey, as the Lord God of thy fathers hath promised thee. Therefore it shall be, when ye be gone over Jordan, that ye shall set up these stones, which I command you this day, in Mount Ebal, and thou shalt plaster them with plaster. And there shalt thou build an altar unto the Lord thy God, an altar of stones. Thou shalt not lift up any iron tool upon them. Thou shalt build the altar of the Lord thy God of whole stones, and thou shalt offer burnt offerings therein unto the Lord thy God. And thou shalt offer peace offerings, and shalt eat there, and rejoice before the Lord thy God. And thou shalt write upon the stones all the words of this law very plainly. And Moses and the priests, the Levites, spake unto all Israel, saying, Take heed, and hearken, O Israel, this day thou art become the people of the Lord thy God. Thou shalt therefore obey the voice of the Lord thy God, and do his commandments, and his statutes which I command thee this day. And Moses charged the people the same day, saying, These shall stand upon Mount Gerizim, to bless the people when ye are come over Jordan, Simeon and Levi, and Judah and Issachar, and Joseph and Benjamin. And these shall stand upon Mount Ebal to curse Reuben, Gad, and Asher, and Zebulun, Dan, and Naphtali. And the Levites shall speak and say unto all the men of Israel with a loud voice, Cursed be the man that maketh any graven or molten image, an abomination unto the Lord, the work of the hands of the craftsmen, and putteth it in a secret place. And all the people shall answer and say, Amen. Cursed be he that setteth light by his father or his mother. And all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be he that removeth his neighbor's landmark. And all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be he that maketh the blind to wander out of the way, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be he that perverteth the judgment of the stranger, fatherless and widow, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be he that lieth with his father's wife, because he uncovereth his father's skirt, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be he that lieth with any manner of beast, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be he that lieth with his sister, the daughter of his mother, and the daughter of his, and the daughter of his father, and the daughter of his mother, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be he that lieth with his mother-in-law, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be he that smiteth his neighbor secretly, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be he that taketh reward to slay an innocent person, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be he that confirmeth not all the words of this law to do them. And all the people shall say, Amen. Alright, keep your finger there in Deuteronomy chapter 27. Right away I'm going to go to Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8. <clears throat> now, this here passage of scripture is right on the heels of when the covenant was avouch between God and Israel. This covenant was made, keep all the commandments. And they answered and affirmed and certified that certainly they were. This was a contractual agreement that was made between God and his people at this time. Verse 16, back if you remember, I'll read it out loud, says, This day the Lord thy God hath commanded thee to do these statutes and judgments. Thou shalt therefore keep and do them with all thine heart and with all thy soul. And we talked about that last week. Now, if we remember, Joshua, at the end of his journey and of his life, he asked the people again to reaffirm what Moses here at the end of Deuteronomy is affirming. He said, follow the commandments. Choose ye this day, the famous verse in Joshua 24. He said, choose ye this day whom you will serve, the gods with your fathers served on the other side of the flood or the Lord God. 
And he said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And that was the decision that Joshua made. And the people made the same decision. They said, we will serve the law, the Lord. We will obey the law in all of its points. Joshua then made the statement, you cannot serve the Lord. He said, for he is an holy God and he is a jealous God. What was he saying? In your own power, in your own strength, it is not in you to serve the living God. God, and obviously people prove this time and time again, both in the Bible and in this room. We cannot wholly serve the Lord God, though we avouch that we will, and we answer back to God, and and our heart affirms and certifies to Him, yes, Lord, I want to obey you. I will obey you. Certainly we often and, and often always do fall short of that. You cannot serve the Lord, for He is holy. He is a jealous God. Over there in Hebrews chapter 8, I had you turn to. Look there in verse 7. The Bible says, For if that first covenant, and this is the one that we're talking about here now in Deuteronomy, being reaffirmed with a new group of people, he said, For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. Doesn't that make sense? If the first covenant worked, then why would God just go and, for no reason at all, bring in a new. But look at the problem here. Verse 8 highlights it very clearly. There was no problem with the covenant, but watch, it says, for finding fault with them. If that covenant was faultless, then there wouldn't have been one replacing it. But the fault that was found was with them. Continues on, it says, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. Why? Because they continued not in my covenant. And I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness. And their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. In that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. And certainly the truth is we cannot serve God. And so God makes this new covenant where he writes his laws on our hearts and on our minds and then affirms that we will be his people. Why? Because he was merciful to us in our unrighteous state. Because our sins and our iniquities... It's not just that they weren't accounted to us anymore. It's that God literally remembers them no more. What a great thing. Past, present, future sins before God when this covenant is fully realized, and obviously that's not until we're fully glorified, all those sins, past, present, and future, will be forgotten, remembered no more by the Lord God. We cannot serve God, of course, and keep His commandments, as maybe even our heart's desire is. But we can certainly believe on He who did serve the Lord fully, and He who died in that ministry, and we can be saved by our faith in Him, in Christ alone. Go back to Deuteronomy chapter 26. And so then that first verse, I already read it for you, Deuteronomy 26 and verse 16 deals with the fact that this is the the, the statement, this is the command that goes forth. The people in verse 17, it says, Thou hast to vouch the Lord thy God this day to be thy God and to walk in his ways and to keep his statutes and his commandments and his judgments and to hearken to his voice. That's what the people affirmed. And you know what? We often, and I think every day, should refresh ourselves and, and prayer to God and say, you know what, God, forgive me for what I have done. And certainly he has, we ask. And, and confess our sins before him. And he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Then each day we should again avouch to God, certify, agree with him and say, I want to keep your ways, your statutes, your commandments. I want to follow your judgments and hear your voice and certainly hearken unto it. 
That should be something that we are constantly doing as believers. Now, God's going to certify his end. In verse 18, it says, And the Lord hath avouched thee this day to be his peculiar people. And he hath promised thee that thou shouldst keep all his commandments, and to make thee high above all the nations which he hath made in praise, and in name, and in honor, that thou mayest be an holy people unto the Lord thy God, as he hath spoken. So the promise coming back from God, he certifies and avouches this God that cannot lie will certainly keep this, and it is certainly kept, though, again, not fully realized. Because here he's promising we'll be high above all nations, and I talked about this last week, and we're not there. We'll be lifted up in praise, and we're not there. In name and in honor, we will be above all people, holy unto God. And certainly, at this time where we're standing, we are not there. But God will keep this promise and his end of the avouchment, the, the promise, the, the agreement that is taking place. The only reason it didn't take place was because we failed. To be fully realized in the last day, the Bible says, as he hath spoken, so shall we re receive of what God is promising here in verse 18 and 19. Nevertheless, we need to understand that these indeed are commandments. And that's what God shows us all the way through Deuteronomy until now. And so the people are agreeing to keep commandments. Thou shalt, thou shalt not. It is still our duty and our responsibility to do those things. Whenever we cease from doing what we're supposed to do, or we do something that we're not supposed to do, that is sin. For sin is the transgression of the law. Here's the law that is a line. You cross it, you've sinned before a holy God. So these are commands, of course, though they are also a promise that will once be made. Look at the Ten Commandments. All of those, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt love the Lord thy God, thou shalt honor thy father and mother. We fail at them today, but one day, certainly, thou shalt not steal. It won't even be in you a desire to steal. You'll be perfect and glorified. Wonderful. Sin will have no effect over you. Sin, where is your sting? O oh, death and hell. Where is your victory? We'll cry out in that day. The promise will be certainly realized. Nevertheless, these are still commands that we need to follow and take heed to. Now I'm jumping over into the next chapter, and I believe the context allows it. And it says, and Moses, in verse 1, and Moses with the elders of Israel commanded the people, saying, Keep all the commandments which I command you this day. And certainly that is a tall order. And any, any of us who have read through Deuteronomy, and we all have together, if you've missed one, they're up there online for now, and you can go and check them out. Read through the scriptures yourself. It's a tall order what Moses is commanding the people. Verse 2, it says, And it shall be on the day when ye shall pass over Jordan into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, that thou shalt set thee up great stones and plaster them with plaster. I don't know if that's pronounced plaster or plaster. <clears throat> Regardless, though, that word plaster is also found in Amos chapter 21, or 2 and verse 1. You don't need to go there, but it says lime over there. Okay, that same word underlying the text. Deuteronomy. Plaster is also lime. Your, your English dictionary will give you that same definition. Over there in Amos, you find it actually says that someone burned the bones of a certain king into lime. And so what we're finding here is being discussed is the great stones are set up there once they enter into the new land that was promised them, and they're Plaster with plaster. They're covered in lime. It's like a whitewash. In the old days, that's you didn't have this 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 uh, this fancy paint. You would you would whitewash your walls every every year. You'd put that whitewash on, and that was what it was made of. It was made of lime, and that would protect whatever surface you were trying to protect. I'm thinking of uh, you know was it Huckleberry Finn, right? The, the beginning of their adventures together in Tom Sawyer. They were whitewashing. A paint, a, a fence, and that was would be what it was made up of is is lime, which was made by essentially boiling up the bones of, of something into that substance and placing it on there. Now, some interesting connections that you find here, um, just in type and just in examples, is that in First Peter two and verse five it says, "Ye as lively stones are built up," and it says there, "You're accepted, acceptable rather." to God by Jesus Christ. So God defines each and every one of us as lively stones, living stones. Christ, of course, being the chief cornerstone, we are built up into the foundation of a temple that God is putting together 
acceptable to God only by Jesus Christ. Here it's interesting because once they enter in to receive the promise, here these stones get set up, even as us as lively stones are builded up. They're made white by the plastering that takes place here. And they're written on. And what did we just read about when we went over into Hebrews? That one day we will be lively stones, white, with the word of God written upon us. It's an interesting correlation there. We will one day stand in the promise of God, even as Israel is being told that they're going to enter into a promise, the promised land, but we're going to stand in the promise of God, clean, white, with the very law of God written on our hearts. Why? Because God gave this promise by Christ. And of course that's not realized yet, but you can see a little bit of that imagery playing out here by type. Great stones set up, made white, written on is what they were to act out when they went into the promised land. And we'll receive that same thing in, in full realization one day. Verse 4, we'll continue on. I didn't read verse 3 yet. Let me do that. And thou shalt write upon them all the words of this law, when thou art passed over, that thou mayest go in into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. And again, we receive what we do by gift, don't we? The land that... God giveth thee a land that floweth with milk and honey, as the Lord God of thy fathers hath promised thee. So there it is. We will stand clean, white, with the law written on our hearts one day, even as these stones, I believe, represent here. Verse 4, it says, Therefore it shall be when ye be gone over Jordan, that ye shall set up these stones, which I command you this day, in Mount Ebal, and thou shalt plaster them with plaster. Okay? So therefore, we see, and we can go back to Deuteronomy, keep your finger, 11 and verse 29, to when these two mountains are first mentioned. The first one you don't have in the context yet, but we read about that in Deuteronomy 11 and verse 29, God foretelling what would take place. He said, And it shall come to pass, when the Lord thy God hath brought thee into the land, whither thou goest to possess it, Deuteronomy 11 verse 29, that thou shalt put the blessing upon Mount Gerizim and the curse upon Mount Ebal. Okay, so back in the context of Deuteronomy chapter 27, we find that God is commanding them to take those stones that they're setting up specifically in Mount Ebal, which points to the curses of God. Now, the law of God unto us is known as the law of sin and death. The law brings us into condemnation before a holy and righteous God. And that's why Joshua said, Choose you this day whom you will serve. And the people said, We will serve the Lord. And he's like, You can't. <laughs> that's discouraging from the leadership, isn't it? Well, what is he trying to tell them? You can of your own strength. You will fail. But continue in those things. Continue to desire to serve him, even with the same zeal you have today. The law then is a curse, and this is why it is brought into Mount Ebal, which is the mount that will represent the curse, and the mount where the gathering of the tribes there will be there to stand and to curse according to the word of God. So, the law of sin and death brings condemnation to us. Why? Because we're guilty of it. And the only way that we can sufficiently atone for our own sins is to go and spend eternity in hellfire. That's a curse, right? Christ being the blessing, we'll see that later. At best, though, the law serves as simply a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, to make us recognize you cannot serve the Lord. And so we see that and recognize it. Our hearts are convicted that we've fallen short of the glory of God that he has put forth. And therefore, we confess that the law is righteous. We confess that we aren't, and we ask for the Savior. It's the best part about the law is though it does curse and condemn us, it actually points us to Jesus Christ. So these stones then were reared up in that cursed mount. And I think that's another then shadow picture of what we have today. We standing here as believers on the Lord Jesus Christ. We have the earnest of the inheritance. In other words, when we trusted Christ that one time and accepted his sacrifice 2,000 years ago on that cross as atonement for our sins, and he gave us the gift of eternal life. The moment that took place, the earnest of the inheritance, 
right? One day we will inherit all things and we will be, we will be perfect in heaven, glorified, sinless. We inherited the Spirit of God to come and dwell within us. That's the earnest. That's the down payment for the ultimate payment that we will one day receive in glory. So what do we have here? Those white stones with the law of God written upon them are now reared up in the mount of cursing. <laughs> it's like us standing here with that promise that one day we will be perfect. The Holy Spirit of God bringing every word into our remembrance, teaching us of all things, with the ability through His power to succeed in following after and keeping these laws and these statutes, even when sometimes we fail. We stand here as those whited stones in the Mount of Cursing. We stand here as perfect inwardly in a sin-filled and corrupt and cursed world, even as being pictured here, I believe. A standing with the earnest in this awful place. Verse 5 will continue. It says, And there shalt thou build an altar unto the Lord thy God, an altar of stones. Thou shalt not lift any iron tool upon them. So you can go in your own time to Exodus chapter 20, where God actually deals with this in particular. Whenever an altar was made, it was to be the collection of stones. No tools upon them, just this one fits and that one fits and you shape them together and they're all natural stones to build up the altar where you would put sacrifices. You could also do it with earth. They could build up earth together if it wasn't a stony place. And that was accepted. You weren't to go and to carve and to chip it. So watch out for altars, as people call them, that are formed with man's tools, tools of iron. That's not an altar that God would find acceptable. And he continues on in that when he says in verse 6, Thou shalt build the altar of the Lord thy God of whole stones, and thou shalt offer burnt offerings thereon unto the Lord thy God. And thou shalt offer peace offerings, and shalt eat there and rejoice before the Lord thy God. And thou shalt write upon the stones all the words of this law very plainly. Very plainly. Okay, so when you look at what God is trying to do here is he is trying to show that his sacrifice is a rejoicing thing and it all actually surrounds the presentation of the word of God. Notice how the word of God in context has followed through. The words of God are written upon the stones. The words of God are obeyed there in verse 1. And here the words of God, it's highlighted again in verse 8, that thou shalt write upon them very plainly, very clearly for you to see. Um, I'm going to go to, and you can follow, Habakkuk in chapter 2. <clears throat> you'll be after Hosea, so the big prophets. You'll find Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk. Okay, <laughs> If you can find Habakkuk, I couldn't tell you a page number because our books aren't the same. But he's just a little one there after the big prophets. Habakkuk then, in chapter 2, after Nahum, before Zephaniah, Habakkuk chapter 2, and in verse 1, it says, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. There's your ministry in, in light of the scriptures. Watching, set up on an high tower, which is Christ, watching to see what he will say unto us, waiting to hear and to hearken unto the word of God, waiting to, des to decide what I shall answer when I am reproved. And you know what? I, when we're reproved of the scriptures, when we hear what he says and it's of reproof, it's correcting us, it's instructing us to do something differently than we are now, our answer ought to be, yea, Lord, and accept it, and then do what he says. Verse 2, it continues, it says, And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain, upon tables, that he may run that readeth this. So God's vision then for us, even as it was for the prophet Habakkuk, and even as he was dealing with the people of Israel, the multitudes that were there, is that the vision or the scriptures or the commands or the ordinance or whatever we have here would be written out plain. Why? So that he that readeth it may run. And Apostle Paul talked about run the race that is set before us as an illustration of the type of activity that Christians are, are engaged in. It's, it's, a, it's an endurance activity. 
Keep those feet moving. Keep that heart rate up. Keep, keep at it. Keep going. Don't give up. Don't stop. Keep your feet moving. But we need plainness upon the tables. We need the scriptures to be clearly understood. Verse 3, it says, For the vision is yet for an appointed time. But at the end it shall speak and not lie. And we have a lot of scriptures, I believe, in the Bible that they might have had an initial fulfillment in the time of Habakkuk, in the time of Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, and so on. But there are also visions that are yet for an appointed time, and at the end they shall speak to us and shall not lie. We've got to be ready to hear. We've got to be like it was in verse 1, watching on the tower with Christ, looking, taking that high vantage point to see what's coming our way and being ready to hear when he speaks, answer when you're reproved with the affirmative, yea, Lord, yea. Though it tarry, second part of verse 3, wait for it. <laughs> though Christ tarries, wait. The, the, though, though, though the news of, of, of health issues that have come from afar, tarry, wait. Though you desire some prayer to be answered, it tarry, wait for it. Because it will surely come. It will not tarry. You know what that means? The tearing is only in our point of view. God, I prayed for this to be solved in my life. I prayed for healing. God, I prayed for, I need answers. Why are you tearing, Lord? It will surely come. He is not tearing just because you think he is. God's in control. God knows the exact moment that these things need to come to fruition. At the appointed time there, he says in verse 3. Verse 4 then, it says, Behold, his soul, which is lifted up, is not in, upright in him. In other words, if you're proud, you're, you're not right with God. But, I love this, the just shall live by his faith. That's how we live. That is our life. It's our faith. That's our, that's our part of this walk. But it needs to be plain, what we're hearing, so that it can be believed, so that we can then act upon it by faith. Go back to Deuteronomy chapter 27. I was led there simply because of that, that word plain. Make it plain upon tables. And this is exactly what he's being commanded there. Moses, in Deuteronomy 27, right upon the stones, right upon these tables, all the words of this law very, very plainly. Moses said the exact same thing. As we heard over there, the importance of those scriptures being in Habakkuk very plain and clear was that we needed to understand them, to believe them, to act upon them by faith. Now look what Moses says in verse 9. And Moses and the priests and the Levites spake to all Israel, saying, Take heed. And that means watch. That means wait. That means be ready. Heed these things. And hearken. Hearken isn't just an auditory noise that comes into my ears. That's actually hearing what's coming in and then doing something about it. Hearken to this. Listen to what I'm saying. Be ready to act upon it. Take heed and hearken, O Israel, this day thou art become the people of the Lord thy God. What a wonderful gift. Think about it. You are the people of the Lord God. Don't take that lightly. Moses said the same thing. It's important. We need to hear this plainly to believe and to act upon it by faith. We need to be ready to hear what God has to say for us and to us. Verse 10, Thou shalt therefore obey the voice of the Lord thy God. Why? Because you're his people. And do his commandments. Why? Because you're his people. And his statutes. Why? Because you're his people. Which I command thee this day. And so Moses commanded them. Then he put it on great stones, or he will one day anyways. Although he didn't get to fulfill this promise. It was Joshua, we'll find. And, and you can go check that out in Joshua chapter 8. I won't go there. But this was the, the point. You hear it. You see it, you read it, you absorb it, you obey it. That's why the Word of God is here. And that's why God makes it so plain for us. We speak English and God gave us the Word in English. Verse 11, Moses charged the people the same day saying, These shall stand upon Mount Gerizim to bless the people when you are come over Jordan, Simeon and Levi and Judah and Issachar and Joseph and Benjamin. And these shall stand upon Mount Ebal to curse Reuben, Gad, Aser, Zebulun, Dan, and Naphtali. And this, of course, was fulfilled, as I said, in Joshua. You can go there another time, chapter 8 and verse 30 through 35. 
Oh, that's a few pages to the right. Let's go there. Joshua chapter 8. Joshua chapter 8. The very next book in your Bible. <clears throat> Verse 32, Joshua 8, verse 32, and it says, And he wrote there upon the stones a copy of the law of Moses, which he wrote in the presence of the children of Israel. But he didn't just read it. The Bible says in verse 34, And afterward he read all the words of the law, the blessings and cursings, according to all that is written in the book of the law. And I love this, verse 35. There was not a word of all that Moses commanded, which Joshua read not before all the congregation of Israel with the women and the little ones and the strangers that were conversant among them. And the interesting, amazing thing about that is, is what it's saying literally is that Moses commanded, and Joshua here is reading it. Why? Because he's able to write it. Okay. People that don't think God had a hand in the preservation of the scriptures <clears throat> are missing out on the wonderful miracle that is taking place here. The other thing that I notice here, all the congregation is present. Women, little ones, strangers, and them that were conversant among them. It's for everybody. Everybody. Continue on back in Deuteronomy chapter 27. Verse 14. <clears throat> and the Levites shall speak and say unto all the men of Israel with a loud voice. So here he's speaking to the men. Doesn't mean that the people aren't accountable. Even as he spoke to Adam, his original law, thou shalt not eat of this tree of the garden. You have all these to freely eat. It was then Adam's responsibility to carry that forward. And that's a big responsibility. And that's why God gave us the word of God to be accountable to, right? Moses proclaims the law, Joshua pens the law, then Joshua proclaims the law again, and now everybody is accountable to what's been said by God and heard in the preaching and teaching and is contained in the written law. <clears throat> Everybody's accountable to it, but here we see a, a specific responsibility given to the men of Israel. These are who are being specifically addressed. Men then have a great responsibility to teach and to lead in this world. The first one we look at then, verse 15. It says, Cursed be the man that maketh any graven or molten image an abomination unto the Lord, the work of the hands of the craftsmen, and putteth it in a secret place, and all the people shall answer and say, Amen. Graven image is dealt with. You can go to Psalm chapter 115. Psalm chapter 115. <clears throat> Great big book in the middle of your Bible. Psalm 115. <clears throat> now we know that thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image is one of the Ten Commandments there in uh, Exodus 20 and verse 4. But here's a little bit more uh, specific of an idea of why these are so important. Psalm chapter 115. Let me read from verse 1. Not unto us, O Lord. Not unto us, but unto thy name give glory for thy mercy and for thy truth's sake. Yeah, we should want God to be glorified, not me. Verse 2. Wherefore should the heathen say, Where is now their God? But our God is in the heavens and hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. Now from verse 4 it says, Their idols are silver and gold. The work of men's hands... They have mouths, but they speak not. They have eyes, eyes have they, but they see not. Psalm 115, verse 6. They have ears, but they hear not. Noses have they, but they smell not. They have hands, but they handle not. Feet have they, but they walk not. Neither speak they through their throat. They that make them are like unto them. So is everyone that trusteth in them. This is the problem with idols. When you start trusting in a dumb idol, you're trusting in something that has no power. And God here highlights, he's like, yeah, they may have hands, but they handle not. They have noses, but they cannot smell. They have feet, but they can't walk anywhere without being lifted. Their throat will not speak. And you, when you make them, and when you trust in them, are no different. 
Eyes that cannot see, ears that cannot hear, a mouth that cannot speak. Literally, those that would worship idols have lost all of their humanity. This, is, this saying has, has really gripped me over the years. They that make them are like unto them. So is everyone that trusteth in them. If you're building idols, if you're trusting in idols, you're subhuman here. We need to trust in God because that is what humanity is made for. Bottom line, Adam, made, Adam was made in the garden so that God could fellowship with him. Adam breaks off that fellowship and goes and serves idols. He's really not human at that point. Why? Because being human, being man, is to be connected with God. And it's, and it's a deep ditch to fall into idolatry. It's a cursing indeed. Going back to Deuteronomy 27. So you can see then why that would be such a curse. Having ears that hear not, eyes that see not, a mouth that speaks not. You're trapped Verse 16 continues on. It says, Cursed be he that setteth light by his father or his mother, and the people shall say, Amen. I believe that's connecting to uh, honor thy father and thy mother. Setting light means to lightly esteem. Set something as, as of less value. Not much importance. It's a very light thing. The Bible talks about vain and light persons in the New Testament. There, there's, there's vanity, and that's what they're saying. When you set your parents as something that is vain, something that is light, something that is of no importance, you are lightly esteeming them, and we're commanded to honor father and mother. And the wonderful thing about that is it's certainly a cursing if you don't. It's a curse upon any man that wouldn't, but this is the first command with promise. Give high honor to your father and to your mother. That's the first command with promise, and it comes with long life, and it comes with many blessings as a result of it. Verse 17, it says, Cursed be he that removeth his neighbor's landmark, and all the people shall say, Amen. Now you can go, if you want to, uh, you know, chapter 19 and verse 14, or Proverbs 23 and verse 10, if you're taking notes, talks about the same thing. Don't remove your neighbor's landmark. Why? Well, this is stealing. Right? Everybody knows what a landmark is. Right? You got, you know, four corners in a in a big big fielded area and usually they'll they'll rear up a big stone and they'll say, This line ten miles that way to the next landmark is, is where I is, is where I live. Everything contained in these four points is mine. And that's how people would, would show where their land is. Now the interesting thing is this is a very wily and sneaky way of stealing from somebody if you remove their landmark. <clears throat> Most people don't spend a lot of time in the corners of their <laughs> of their land, right? If you think of your, I mean, what's in the corner? You might shove your compost heap there, or, or maybe there's a shed, right? You may go in the shed, but you're not in the corners much. So basically what happens, and I, I worked it out a little bit, was that your acre is 66 feet this way by 660 feet that way. Okay, so if I was to go to my neighbor and remove their landmark, simply in the corner, they're not there that often, I pick up that stone and I walk over one foot and I put it down. Because of the math involved, right, I've now extended it out this way, and the triangle now goes to that other landmark, right? And then there's all this land in between coming to where I'm at. I've changed it from here to here. Right? Only one foot, not a big deal. I've removed his landmark a bit. I'm going to add to myself, if I'm doing that to an average acre, 330 square feet. <laughs> okay? That's about a 1% increase, just under. Okay? Now, if I do that same thing and I pick up that landmark and I decide, okay, I'm going to just one, two, three. Nobody saw that. I drop it down. Now my land goes to that same post. I've added to my land. Nobody saw it. Nobody noticed. Neighbor probably won't even notice. No big deal, right? <clears throat> I've added to myself 990 square feet. That's a 2% increase of my overall land simply by moving a landmark a few feet. You can see how this is, this is an opportunity for, for great, wily, and sneaky theft upon your neighbor. Okay, so don't do that. That's what God here is, prom is, is commanding. And you're cursed if you do so. God's not going to bless that land you just stole from your neighbor. And all the people shall say amen. We should be in agreement with that. 
Verse 18 then, Deuteronomy 27, verse 18. Cursed be he that maketh the blind to wander out of the way, and all the people shall say, Amen. Somebody who takes advantage of somebody that's handicapped, puts a stumbling block in front of the blind, the Bible says, there's no fear of God in their hearts. I mean, who's going to take advantage of somebody that, that cannot see, make them to stumble, somebody that cannot see, hear, cause them to stumble as a result of, of the infirmity of their flesh? No fear of God in somebody like that. And think of Christ's ministry to those very people, the blind, the deaf, the dumb, the lame. I mean, Christ made a point to go and to help these people, not to harm and to hurt and to, and to cast them down. Cursed are you if you would do such a thing. Maketh the blind to wander out of the way. Oh, here, let me help you. Let me lead you astray. There's a spiritual application too. Taking people that are blind, babes in Christ, and, and leading them in the path that you want them to go. Cursed be that man. Cursed be that man. All the people shall say amen. Verse 19, Cursed be he that perverteth the judgment of the stranger, fatherless and widow, and all the people shall say amen. Just weights, just measures, just epaw, those are all expected in the context of Deuteronomy. We've heard it time and time and time again. God wants righteousness in judgment, weights and measures, and he wants everything to be done without respect of persons. Be equal in your judgment. Be equal in your, your dealings and measures. All the people shall say amen. We should agree with that. Certainly by now hearing all that's gone on in, in Deuteronomy and how God puts a big weight upon having just weights and measures and righteousness and judgment. Verse 20, it says, Cursed be he that lieth with his father's wife, because he hath uncovered his father's skirt. Verse 21, Cursed be he that lieth with any manner of beast, and all the people shall say, Amen. Verse 22, Cursed be he that lieth with his sister, the daughter of his father or the daughter of his mother. Verse 23, Cursed be he that lieth with his mother-in-law, and all the people shall say, Amen. And you can go to Leviticus 18 for... Um, God highlighting the abominations that are mentioned here. And then you can go to Leviticus chapter 20 and you're going to find the punishments for some of these grievous sensual sins that are mentioned here. And these things are punishable, many of them, by death. Right? Cursed. Yeah, amen, cursed. Be those that would do such things. God says that the people of the land that they're about to inherit did all of them. And that's why God threw them out of the land. That's a cursing upon a people that would have these kind of sensual sins in their lives. Verse 24, Cursed be he that smiteth his neighbor secretly, punching somebody in the dark. Not much to say about that. Verse 25, Cursed be he that taketh reward to slay an innocent person, and all the people shall say amen. That's, that's being paid to slay somebody. That's a hitman dealings. You've got no dog in this fight, but you will simply accept money to take a life. What a cursing that would bring on somebody. <clears throat> it's murder as well, punishable by death. <clears throat> Verse 26, Cursed be he that confirmeth. And here's the catch-all, right? Because God here isn't just highlighting... Um, he, he, God here isn't giving you the whole law again. We've already saw it. He's highlighting some, some proper and, 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 and high points of his law. Verse 26, Cursed be he that confirmeth not all the words of this law to do them, and all the people shall say amen. And that's why verse 9 is so important when Moses comes out. And he says, Take heed and hearken, O Israel, this day thou art become the people of the Lord thy God. Therefore listen up, hearken. You all just agreed to this, just one chapter previous. And in the context, it would have just rolled right into each other, these events. You've avouched the Lord thy God that you will obey His ways, His statutes, His commandments, His judgment. You will hearken unto His voice. He's avouched you this day that He promises that He will, he will keep you and care for you if ye do these things, but often, or ultimately you will be His peculiar people unto Him. You will be lifted up in praise and honor because He's not going to break His commandments. But God knows that you will break His his commandments. God knows that ye cannot serve him. God knows that even the people of God are going to have some of these curses listed here come upon them. But he still wants you, as in verse 26, to confirm it, the word. I, I confirm that this is 
right. I'm, I'm setting this to my seal. This is the word of God. This is good. This is right. This is what I want to do, even as he asked of his people. And they avouched it. Even as they're going to, once they put up those placed stones in Ebal, they're going to affirm it before Joshua. We will serve the God, God of our fathers. We will honor his law and obey it. We will serve him. And he says, you cannot serve him. And I know you can't. But God wants you to nevertheless confirm it. This is the law. This is righteous. This is just. This is what God wants me to do. And I want to heed it. And I want to hearken it. Hearken to it. And promise him this day. And, and work with him. And let him work into you to put these laws in your hearts. And to do these laws through you. But all this has to take place by faith. By trusting God. And that's why I like that picture that he gave us of those white stones. Written the law written on them, standing up in the, in, the, in the land of cursing, the mountain of cursing. He gave that as a picture. Look, you're white. You got the law written on you. If you've read it, the Spirit can bring it into your remembrance. Read it twice, though. Read it three times. Read it four times. Give, give Him more power to bring those things into your remembrance. He promises all things can come to your remembrance. He promises also to reveal all truths unto you that are contained in the Scriptures. This law is written upon us. We are white stones standing in the land of cursing. Of course, God recognizes that, but he wants us to remain white best we can. That comes with each and every day, repenting of our sins, saying, God, look, yesterday I blew it in this way, that way, and this way. God, help me. And he washes you clean again and then lets you walk forward in a newness of life each and every day, moment by moment, trusting him to confirm again in your hearts all the words of this law. Confirm them again. And even as we're reading through this and the preaching's coming, we're, we're hearing these. I'm studying these things out and I'm, I'm going back through them and I'm learning more from each one of these. I'm confirming again and again. I, I break that, God, but I confirm that is the law. And I confirm these to do them. It's my desire to do them. Then we just heed, we hearken, and we, we walk with God in these things. And that's how we keep the cursing out of our lives. That's how we, we, we see that these, these commands and eventually these ten things were like, Praise the Lord, I, I, I used to, right? I was somebody that would definitely remove my neighbor's landmark. I'd go and try to park my boat on his land, you know, something like that, right? But you know what? Glory to God, I don't do that anymore. That curse isn't in my life anymore. And all the other curses that are contained in all the words of this law, when we break them, cursed be ye. Of course, this isn't an exhaustive list, but Go back through. There's hundreds of commandments. Old, New, Old Testament, New Testament. If you don't do them, you will be cursed. And we should all say, Amen to these things. Amen, even as the people did. Amen, I agree. Even if you may be sitting there as it's being preached, you know, going, ah, I did that yesterday. But, you know what? Amen. <laughs> it's the truth. It's not hypocrisy to admit your fault and to ask God to get you right and help you. Right? That's what God wants from us. Confirm the law to do it. Right? You've got to accept that it is the word of God. It is his law. And that's what he wants. And then just get after it. Run that race. And finish strong. Thank you, God.